Audio recording for this meeting has begun. I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon. My name is Molly Marin. I am the webinar coordinator for the New York State uh, Response to Technical Assistance Center for Response to Intervention. Just a few reminders, a copy of today's PowerPoint is available on our webpage. If you'd like to uh, grab that and follow along, you're welcome to do so. Today's webinar will be recorded and a link to that recording it will be posted to our webpage also. At the end of today's presentation, we will have a very short evaluation. If you could please take a few minutes to complete that, we very much appreciate the feedback. It's very brief and uh, we do appreciate that. Also during today's webinar, please use the chat box for any questions or comments that you may have. There will be time at the end for questions, so please, um, please take advantage of that. Today is the fourth and final webinar in our database decision making in an RTI process strand. Please stay tuned to our webpage for information on upcoming webinars. We we'll hope to have something in the next couple of weeks on our spring webinars. At this time, I'm very pleased to have back with us again today Dr. Edward Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is currently professor of school psychology and director for the Center for Promoting Research to Practice in the College of Education at Lehigh University, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He is the 2006 winner of the Senior Scientist Award given by the Division of School Psychology of the American Psychological Association in recognition of senior member of the field who has provided a, a sustained program of outstanding theoretical research. He is author, co-author, and co-editor of 16 books, including his most recently published text with Joseph Kowalski and Amanda Vander Hayden, The RTI Approach to Evaluating Learning Disabilities. Dr. Shapiro is best known for his work in curriculum-based assessment and methods for assessing and intervening in academic skills problems with elementary age students. Among his many projects, Dr. Shapiro recently received his second U.S. Department of Education training grant to train school psychologists as facilitators of RTI processes. Over the past decade, Dr. Shapiro has been working as a consultant with the Pennsylvania Department of Education to facilitate the implementation of the response to intervention methodology for the state. At this time, I'm very pleased to welcome again Dr. Shapiro. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Molly. And, uh... I want to say uh, Happy New Year and uh, welcome back to all the, all the participants in the webinar. I hope everyone had a wonderful opportunity to have a little break. I know you're probably back in, uh, in session for the last week or so, um, but I certainly hope that everyone had a chance to uh, refresh themselves and are looking forward to finally the, the last part of this, this uh, webinar series. And what I hope will be um, the opportunity to really be responsive to any questions that you end up having. Um, let me just uh, outline what I want to cover in today's webinar. And um, I decided I think the thing to do would be to talk about um, some elements of the database decision-making process and the, uh, the assessment processes that are um, a little bit more advanced topics, things that are a little bit more beyond just um, our traditional, typical things that we talk about when we talk about uh, RTI. And what I thought would be a very useful topic to talk about are something that we call seasonal effects and the impact of growth on both curriculum-based measurement and on computer-adapted tests. So I'm going to talk a bit about computer-adapted tests again today um, and the relationship of what we call seasonal effects on these measures. I'm also going to go over and review some of the basics on decision-making guidelines and talk a little bit about some of the nuances of the processes we use when we make instructional decision-making as we're using it as we're going through the RTI model. Most important, most importantly, um, today is a day for questions and answers. So uh, what I'm really hoping you will do is at any time during the webinar, please uh, put down or write down and in the chat box your questions. Um, I expect to have at least uh, 30 minutes or so near the end of this uh, presentation to be able to answer every question that gets asked. Um, I know sometimes when you have many, many questions, uh, maybe you forget, you come up with a question and it comes later. 
please remember, <clears throat> I'm always available to answer questions via email after the webinar is over, but I would really love to be able to share your, your question with everyone uh, on the session and get good answers to, to everybody's questions as much as possible. So let me start with the concept here of growth. And when we talk about growth, one of the things that we typically have talked about when we looked at how we monitor and evaluate the growth of student performance over time is we ask the question, is growth typical? Do we know what typical growth should be for CBM reading in particular? And one of the things that becomes very interesting is um, we typically look at a trend or we look at a trend over time. And one of the things that's very important to understand is that we assume in many places in the RTI process, in the database decision-making process, that the growth across the year has occurred in a linear fashion. Linear meaning that the growth between the first data point in the fall and the second data point in the winter and the third data point in the spring is a straight line. Interestingly, many researchers, and you can see here some of the inf information is cited here, many researchers and many individuals using this process recognize that you have to carefully consider whether the growth pattern is linear, that is a straight line, or curvilinear, that is not a straight line. Which of those two explains the growth rate better? Well, interestingly, for CBM reading, there has been quite a bit of research that's been done over the last few years, over the last many years, five years or so, by a number of well-known researchers, uh, Ted Crist and Scott Ardowin and his group, um, Hank Fine and their group out in Oregon, um, and uh, Kristen Missel and her group uh, at the University of Iowa. Um, there has been folks that have looked at this, and what they've looked at is whether there is the same amount of growth between fall and winter as there is from winter to spring. And interestingly, most of the research that has been done has found that the growth rates between fall and winter are typically greater than they are from winter to spring. When we, when we look at that, at, at, this, at this issue, I'm going to give you illustrations of this using different kinds of measures to show, it, to show you and illustrate exactly how this really uh, shows up in the data, it has implications for how we set our goals. Because if there is greater growth from fall to winter than there is from winter to spring, then perhaps instead of using a full year growth rate for rate of improvement, we may need to be using growth rates that are half a year long to really know what we should expect students to accomplish between fall and winter and then winter and spring. It ends up that actually, of all the studies that have been done, there really is only one study that really found that the growth rate from winter to spring was greater than the growth rate from fall to winter. And that was uh, Graney, Missal, and Martinez, 2009. Most of the studies have found that the growth rate really occurs, most of the growth occurs, the largest amount of growth that occurs in CBM reading is fall to winter. Let me show you an example. So here is data taken from the Dibbles sixth edition ORF norms. And what I've graphed here is the number of words that are found in, the, in their benchmarks between fall and winter growth and winter to spring. And what you'll see and notice is for all grades except third, the amount of growth between fall and winter and winter to spring is identically the same or greater in fall to winter. That is, in second grade, in fifth grade, and sixth grade, the growth between fall and winter was much greater than it was from winter to spring. This is Dibble's sixth edition, which most folks today probably aren't, aren't still using since they've been re revised quite a bit. If you graph these, put them into a graphic form, here's what the graph looks like. And what you can see is in this bar, the, the, the sort of the gray bar versus the, the brown bar, um, that the growth from fall to winter 
what's greatest in second, fifth, and sixth relative to winter to spring. However, winter to spring in third grade was a little higher in winter to spring, and in fourth grade they were the same. If we look at the Dibble's next ORF using the DMG norms, now I only say that because as most of you are probably familiar with, um, there are two sets of normative data out there for use with the Dibble's next. One developed by the, the Dynamic Measurement Group, the DMG group, and the other by the University of Oregon. These are the data from the DMG group. And what you see here is in second, third, and fourth grade, the amount of growth from fall to winter was higher than it was from winter to spring. Now, as you see in fourth grade, it's not much different. And actually, in fifth and sixth grade, it was just slightly greater in fifth and more in, in sixth. So you can see in some grades, the growth was greater fall to winter, in some grades, winter to spring. Here's what that looks like graphically. Again, same data, just placed into a graphic form, so you can sometimes look at the picture and get the, get the sense of this, rather than just look at the numbers. Here's AIMSWeb for RCBM, and the AIMSWeb data is probably a little bit more dramatic in that really, in first grade, is the only place where winter to spring really is much greater. Now, that makes sense to me, because if you think about first graders learning to read, they start as non-readers in the beginning of fall. They, and by the winter, you've got a number of kids who are just beginning the reading process, and that probably accelerates quite a bit by the end of the first grade period. But you can see second, third, fourth, and somewhat in fifth, and a little bit in sixth, the fall to winter growth is greater than the winter to spring. You know, what you'll also notice is that begins to... to be different when you get to fifth and sixth grade, which is also something important to, to notice. And here's the graphic of those same data. One of the very interesting things, then, is why. So why do we get some difference in fall to winter versus winter to spring? And there's a variety of reasons that are speculated about this. And I think a lot of these are really speculation. I don't think any of them have been found uh, to have very strong empirical support, but they've been speculated as to the reason why these kinds of things happen. So one example is that in most states, the high stakes testing takes place usually in the spring, March or April. Yeah, I know there are a state, there is a state or two where it's actually done in September, which I haven't quite figured out how they do that, but I know there are some states where they do it at different times. But most states are March and April. I believe in New York State, the testing I thought was March and April. And somebody can put in a little chat note here if I'm correct on that. Um, so one of the things that sometimes is thought to happen is once the state high stakes test is, is given and administered to students, there's a tendency to sort of relax the instructional process. New York is April. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, there's a tendency to relax in the instructional process. I don't mean that teachers stop teaching, but there might be a less of an intensity in the instructional process because we passed the high stakes testing point. Um, a second thing that sometimes people have looked about at and talked about is that maybe what we're really seeing is not so much that we get the most growth from fall to to winter, but what we get is we get a depressed fall score. In other words, because of the summer break, the score obtained in the beginning of the fall is actually a little bit lower than it really is going to be in a short amount of time, that we're going to get a rebound very quickly in that student's performance once they get back into the school process. So what you're really seeing is because we collect that data at the beginning of the fall when we do benchmark data, is we're getting a depressed fall score. And there has been some, some research that's looked at that uh, and demonstrated that indeed there may be some truth to that, that process for CBM data. A third thing is that instructional variables could certainly explain some of these differences and that we do get differences in the instructional uh, pace and in the instructional process at different points in the year. And it may be true that there's a, there's a lot more instruction that's built in to the first half of the school year 
with less new instruction in the second half of the school year. And I think also there could be some variability within the progress monitoring data themselves. So all of those are reasons why this particular uh, um, phenomena may be evident. Well, what about if you're not using a CBM measure? What about if you're using a computer-adapted test? Very interestingly, and I, I believe um, a number of you guys um, are using, um, I'm trying to remember if it was iReady. I think that might be the measure, uh, or something of that nature. I know there was a measure that, that, that some of you are, or I'm gonna, somebody's going to tell me what it is. What was that measure you guys are using again? STAR, some people are using STAR, right? And there are some others that I think are we're using another computer adapted test. iReady, there we go, right. So STAR or iReady, this would be relevant for STAR or iReady users. Interestingly, seasonal effects are usually not evident in computer adapted tests. And one of the reasons why is a computer adapted test is what is called vertically scaled. Um, a vertically scaled measure means that over time, the scale will incrementally increase each time students take the test in a straight level pattern. And it's because the measure is measuring the same set of skills across a large grade distribution. CBM in reading is somewhat like a vertically scaled measure in that at each grade level, there's a shift and a change that occurs in the, the difficulty level of the material. And in that way, there is some vertical scaling or vertical scale like, like vertical scaling going on, but not to the precision of a, of a computer adapted test. Just to, to make sure everybody understands what a computer adapted test is, a computer adapted test is a measure that is based on something called item response theory and how it was constructed. An item response theory test, which is more actually of how the most current tests are developed, is a test that adjusts the items based on student responses and the difficulty of items. So the way a computer adapted test works is a student takes a test, by t they, they get an item. If they get the item right, the computer gives them an item that has been calibrated to be just slightly more difficult than the item that they just got. If they then get that item right again, the computer adjusts and gives them a more difficult item until they get to the point where the student gets the item incorrect. Then the computer adjusts downward to try to find items that the student gets consistently correct. Um, for the psychologist online, this is very similar to finding a ceiling and a basal in a, in, a, in a different kinds of standardized test that we do. The idea here is to try to pinpoint the student's skill placement across a skill sequence. And because the items are very, very carefully calibrated, and because the item, because there's a huge item bank available, and items are not typically repeated very often in this, in this process, we get a much more pinpointed placement of where that student is on the measure. Once you pinpoint the student on that measure, you can now put that measure, put that student's score on a scale. Just like if you think about weight. I, I love to use the example of weight very often. Um, and when you think of weight, uh, every person gets on a scale and measures that you're measured in the same exact metric of pounds. And for your age and your height, you're supposed to be within a certain range. So if you are weighing 150 pounds, but you're only 10 years old, you are really out of line with where you should be. If you are, if you're 10 years old and six foot tall, then you're going to be weighing at a different level. So we can put everybody, however, on that same scale. And that's what a computer adapted test does. These tests are completely administered by computers. They take anywhere usually between 15 to 25 minutes, depends on the different kind of product you're using. Um, 
the measures are very skills focused. In other words, there's not, there's not a, a, a rate based measure like, like we do with oral reading fluency where you're measuring the words correct per minute. Um, and not all students take the same items. It depends on their answers as to what items they take. And that's an interesting component of um, those measures. But the key to understanding these measures for the benchmarking process and for progress monitoring is that the measure results in a scaled score. And that is the key metric. And every one of these computer adapted tests has their own different kind of scaled score. Um, what the score does is it provides the students relative uh, standing to their peers on a national distribution. So we know where this third grader is against every other student taking that test between kindergarten and 12th grade. It provides goals for students' growth, so we can provide an indication of growth. It provides an indication of the group's performance, that is, we can also look at the grade or the school or the district relative to what's expected. And the example that I'm going to use in my discussion today is from STAR. It's the STAR Assessment Enterprise Edition, which is a product of Renaissance Learning. But there are many other measures um, that you can use. Um, for example, Study Island, uh, Scholastic has one, SRI, NWEA MAP, and iReady are all other computer adapted tests that have these same exact characteristics. <clears throat> the, the, the scale score of a computer adapted test is a critical metric for interpreting how a student is doing. And I, like I said, the weight analogy is a good example to think about here. So for, for STAR, their early literacy pre-K measure is from pre-K to third grade ranges from a score of 300 to 900, although I believe they're changing that um, in, uh, in, at some point. But in their reading measure, star reading, the scaled score goes from 0 to 1400. And that covers the range from kindergarten to 12th grade. Kindergarten to 12th grade. So here's an example. This is a star reading scale score, just an example from grades 1 through 3. And if you look here, for example, in the fall, you can see across those different scores that this is the percentile rank. Let's take a student at the 50th percentile. So a student at the 50th percentile in the fall would be expected to have a scale score of 78 on the star reading measure. Um, you would notice, by the way, a student at the 90th percentile would have a scale score of 244 a student at the, scale, at the 10th percentile, a score of 59. And what you can see is there is a um, clear movement from lower to higher scores across the percentiles. And that's what you would expect in star reading. You wouldn't expect a student in the first grade to have a scaled score of 1,000 unless they were like some super genius somehow. That would be amazing. And you can see for each grade, this would be their scaled score. So for, for a student in the 50th percentile, <coughs> excuse me, you could see that they would be at the 78, they would have a score of 78 here, they'd have a score of 197 here, they have a score of 344 in third grade. And those same students by the spring would have scores like in the 50th percentile, they would go from 78 to 181. And you can see that would be a growth rate of four scaled score points per week. Um, and you can see that a student at the 50th percentile for second grade would go from 197 to 334, et cetera. If you look across here now, you can see how the scaled scores go across time. 78 in the fall, 181 in the spring, 197 in the fall, 334 in the spring, 344 in the fall, 436 in the spring. And if you look at this graphically, here's what it looks like. And what you see is something very different than what we see with the CBM measure. What you see here is, this is graph, 75th percentile, 40th percentile and 25th percentile 
across the normative data for star reading. What you've noticed here is between first and second grade, you will notice there is not a decline in the student's performance. Now, their growth is a little less steep between the spring of one year and the fall of the next year. And that's probably due to the summer effect, you know, being off in the summer. But what you can see is what the growth rate is each year goes up so that essentially a student moves across the year in first grade, across the year in second, across the year in third. Here's what it looks like for a CBM using AmesWeb as an example. So what you see here is, is the same typical pattern, fall, winter, spring, and words correct per minute. But then what you get in for after is notice the decline that occurs between the end of grade one and the beginning of grade two. And this is some of what we see in CBM measures. And part of that may be due to this depression of this first data point. Rather that, that is, if you, didn't took, if you took the first data point in October rather than in September, they might not be as low as they are. They might be more in the area of, uh, that would look more like a, like it would look much more like it does here for the computer adapted test measure. So these are just some of the things. To look. Here's Dibble's Next across grades. Just if you're using Dibble's Next, you'll notice again, first grade, second grade, the same kind of, of pattern. And here's fourth grade, uh, third grade. And what you'll notice here in Dibble's Next is at second grade to third grade, there's that summer dip. Same thing in same thing is there in third to fourth grade, but not in first to second. So you get some of that dip here. This looks more like what you see in the Ames Web measure. Okay. So um, there's, a, there's a good question here. Um, and um, let me stop and answer this question right now. I think that would be appropriate. So uh, Joanna asked the question. Are the growth rates revised annually based on the participants' per reported scores? I'm looking at star growth rates from December 2013, and there is a difference. Yes, Joanna, that is correct. Um, the data that I'm showing you are probably not the most current data. They come, they're, they're taken out of the STAR manual is where I took those from, and the Ames Web I took from their database, and, star, and Dibble's Next is pretty standard. Um, but with Ames Web and STAR, those are adjusted every year. So you're going to get slight differences in those numbers because if you're using the most current data, that would be, that, that would be, that would be true. But those differences would be very, very small. They wouldn't be extensive. But very good question, Joanna. Thank you. So let me move on now and talk a little bit about interpreting the data, data because obviously Collecting the data and knowing how to, how to read the data is only one aspect of this. What's really most important is how we make these decisions and how we summarize the importance of the data. And what we know is when you think about data, and particularly we're talking about data now um, that's more progress monitoring oriented, there are three characteristics of the data that we have to look at to summarize performance. We have to look at the level of performance, the slope of performance, and the variability. What's really important to remember when you're looking at that, these kind of data sources is sometimes we will see changes in level but not changes in slope. Or we may see changes in level and slope but we have high variability. Sometimes we won't see changes in level but what we'll get is high variability and what we see are changes in variability. And all of those things may be very important and crucial for fully interpreting the data sets that we have. So level of performance, first of all, is very simple. Level of performance is what changes occur immediately after a program modification occurred. So if I'm doing progress monitoring data and I put an intervention in place, I have a student who goes into a tier two intervention and I have the progress monitoring data being collected, does the new intervention produce an immediate change in the behavior up or down, and that's level of performance. Slope, which we've talked quite a bit about in the last webinar, is trend, and this is a general 
the direction in which the student's performance is changing. Are we getting increases, decreases? Are we staying the same? And what is the rate of change, and how fast is that performance changing over time? And that's that rate of improvement information that we've talked extensively about in the last webinar. Thirdly, variability is important. And the variability is about not so much the trend in one direction or the other or the level, but the up and down movement on the graph. How much stability do we have from day to day? And the stability is really important because many times we may get lots of up and down going on, but if we don't get stability, it's really hard to interpret why we're getting the, those kinds of, uh, of changes at all and whether what we're getting is real, is real data or we're getting noise. Keep in mind, one of the things we're always trying to do when we interpret our, our graphic data and our database decision making over time is we're always trying to separate what we call the signal from the noise. Um, that's a sort of a radio term that came back from, it's, it's used by engineers in quite a bit and physicists, and it has to do with what, how much of the change you're seeing is real and how much of it is just noise. And what we want when we interpret our data sources is we want to know how much real change we have, how much real data differences we have not noise, because if the noise is there, that will make it very difficult to interpret the outcome. One of the things we always talk about as a guideline for instructional decision making is the emphasis when we're looking at progress monitoring data is always on attaining the goal. And we look at trying to make program modifications, uh, differences in inter interventions, um, in order to try to achieve the goal. Increasing a goal is a legitimate change that we might decide, and that is we may have underestimated the student's capacity to be successful and achieve the goals. So increasing a goal might be a legitimate modification of our decision when we look at our data. The thing that I emphasize all the time when I talk to colleagues about this is sometimes the question will get asked, did we overestimate the, uh, the capacity of the student to attain that goal? Are we shooting way too high? And what we really need to do is adjust the goal downward. That is a very, very, very last consideration after everything else has been considered. I would never want to adjust the goal downward. Adjusting the goal downward may make us look better that we've achieved something, but it's a very rare occurrence when we as educators overestimate by such a degree that the student can't possibly achieve that goal. If we have made a mistake in the way we set our goals, if we haven't used good empirically oriented approaches to setting our goals, if we based our goals on pie in the sky ideas, yeah, we can make a big mistake. That's why I went through that whole process with you guys on setting goals based on an empirically derivable process. But if we, if we do those kind of good ways of doing goal setting, it's a very rare event that we should ever have to, have to change <clears throat> our goals downward because we've overestimated the goals. This is a little four-step um, uh, flow chart that I often use uh, when talking about doing these database decision-making processes. And we start by identifying the decision rules. So we have to have some kind of decision rules up front. We have to say what those decision rules are going to be. And I'm going to give you a few examples of those in a minute here as I take you through a couple examples here. We then look at our data to decide how our data looks against those decision rules. And we apply those in step three. And typically, there's one of three decisions that will come out of that decision process. The first is we wait, and that is our instruction looks like it's having an effect. The effect looks like it's getting the result we want. We're going to continue that instruction and recycle ourselves looking at the data at some next point in time. <coughs> Excuse me. A second element would be to raise the goal. This is when we have, we're very convinced 
that not only has our student exceeded what we thought they could do, they've gone way beyond it, and we need to raise the goal, and that's a legitimate way that we would respond. The third would be make a change, and that is our data suggests that the outcomes that we're getting are not what we want them to be, and we need to make a change. And the change we make can be a variety of things, including change the intervention, alter the, the instructional process, change the student to a different tier level. Many different things could be make a ch the kind of changes. The final step, of course, is to then to look at what we've are the outcomes of our decision and determine and implement that change and look at what happened and do more assessment if necessary and recycle back to looking at the data. So I'm going to take you through some examples here in just a second. One of the things that's really important is we need to have some kind of decision rules that we use in making program changes. And I know in New York, I'm looking at a variety of, of, of the RTI sites across the state. Many of you have really excellent decision rules that you use in making these kinds of decisions. And here's one of the typical decision rules that I will come across very often in schools. And that is um, the decision rule is going to be that uh, to make program changes, we're going to do this when performance falls below the aim line for accelerating behaviors or above the aim line after decelerating a behavior for four consecutive data points. So this is a four consecutive data point rule. By having a a priori rule like this, it takes some of that guesswork out of the, the decisions we're going to make in terms of when we're ready to make a change or not. We've already said up front, this is the rule we're going to use, and then we just apply that into our situation. One of the things about decision rules you've got to think about is, well, how often are you doing progress monitoring? For example, um, if you're assessing twice a week and your decision rule was four consecutive data points, you would need two weeks of data before you could make any decisions. But if you were assessing only once a week, which would be more typical progress monitoring data, and that's probably more typical for more intensive level uh, kids who have intensive level needs, it would take you four weeks to get four data points. If you are assessing every other week, which you might be for kids at, uh, at a tier two level of intervention, it will take you eight weeks to get four data points. So you always have to keep in mind when you think of your decision rules that your decision rules will also dictate the minimum amount of time that you're going to have available to put the intervention in place before you can make any kind of change. Um, so here's an example of decision rules below the aim line on four consecutive data points, but the student is parallel to the aim line. So the student's moving on a line that's parallel to the aim line, but with four consecutive data points. Well, if that's the case, we might decide that we're going to wait in that situation because we're not accelerating performance, but we're not decelerating. And then, we, and then we might decide after this continues, if we want to accelerate performance, then we would make some kind of a change. So here's an example. Let me walk you through an example of a, of a four-point data rule. So here's a student who has a baseline. <clears throat> so we're using their uh, median score as their baseline data point to start. Here they have four data points. After the fourth data, we have our first data check. Well, our rule is four data points above the aim line. You can see there were two below and two above. Now, even though there's a really good trend in a positive direction, the right decision is keep on teaching. Wait, because I don't have four data points above the aim line. So now I go four more data points, and I have my next check. Here is the trend for the last four data points. And you can see that that trend is in the opposite direction of what I want. I now have four data points below my aim line. Four data points below the aim line, time to make a change. And that's what this vertical line would indicate. Now, Sometimes I'm asked the question, is it okay to make a change before you get the four data points that are part of your, your, um, your uh, uh, decision process? 
Well, in this data series, for example, if instead of having uh, two data points above and then four below, I had six consecutive data points all down in the range of 20 or so words correct per minute, and after six data points, I'm sitting with my team, I might decide to make a change sooner than reaching my criterion of four data points. And that's because, again, in your clinical judgment, you don't want to keep a student in an intervention or keep a student going in, a, in, a, in an instructional process that's just not working very well. So making that change uh, beforehand, before those four data points are reached, is usually perfectly okay as long as you're convinced that clinically that, you're, that you've got a really strong decision, strong uh, data series in the right direction. So let's say in an example here, the student's performance is above the aim line four out of six data points. So this is a decision, this is a, a, an a priori decision where I'm using four out of six. It may be appropriate to raise the goal and I can use the last three data points to generate uh, a new aim line. So we're going to look at an example. Here's an example where you can see here all these consecutive data points above the aim line. And at the end of this point in time, for the student got to this point, the team decided it was time to raise the goal. Because although this was the starting point and this was the aim line for a student to reach approximately a score of about uh, a little less than 90, this student had accelerated very quickly and stayed above that over, that over the period of time, being assessed here about twice a week. When you get to the point of considering an instructional change, some of the, one of the questions I always get asked is, so what are, the, what are the right things to ask myself or ask the team about making instructional changes? So the very first question I always ask is, are the data to be believed? And that is, is the student being monitored at the appropriate instructional level? Suppose the problem I find when I look at my data, and I look at it carefully, is I've been assessing a student at a much easier instructional level. Well, maybe the right move would be change the level at which I'm actually assessing the student. If a student, for example, is a fifth grader reading at a second grade level, I'm assessing the student in second grade, and they're making great progress, maybe the right move is see how that student's doing at third grade level material or fourth grade level material or even fifth grade level material. The idea being that I want to make a change potentially here to the data that I'm looking at. And what I'm looking at is it was too easy or it was too hard. Is the student a fluent reader but a word caller? Do I have a situation where I'm seeing great gains in fluency but getting nothing in the comprehension world. If that's the case, I can't really trust that my data is telling me that I've got good outcomes of my intervention if all I'm getting is increases in fluency and not necessarily in comprehension. Is the problem decoding? Does the student have a specific decoding difficulty? I'm looking instructionally at what the student's doing. Do they need to have additional practice in in certain areas, or do they have the coding skills, but the problem is fluency needs to change? Is the problem comprehension? Does the student pause at appropriate punctuation? What, are the, what is the, the, the nature of the student's uh, reading speed and the way in which they're, they're, they're reading um, material, their oral reading fluency sounds? Do they really do the right things uh, in terms of showing me that they have comprehension? Do I need a different assessment? Is my assessment really picking up the skill areas that I need? Do I need to do more diagnostic assessment? All of these things are the kind of questions I ask myself when I'm going to make an instructional change in reading. So I'm going to take us through a case example here that illustrates a lot of this. Here's a student named Tim. Now Tim is a new student to this teacher, and he's in what's called an emotional support classroom. Um, in many states, that would be called a student for its behavior disorders or social-emotional disturbance. In our state, in Pennsylvania, it would be called an emotional support classroom. In New York, it's probably an SCD or a behavior disorder classroom. Um, the teacher begins monitoring Tim's performance and reading on the first day he arrives in class. And he's in sixth grade, but she's monitoring him at a fifth grade level because that's the assessed instructional level 
of the student. So our decision rule that we're using is the four consecutive data point rule. So we're using a four decision, four data point rule for making decisions about Tim. So here's Tim's data across approximately the first eight or nine data points. And you can see right here that Tim started out pretty good and then began to show a declining trend until we got out to this last data point when we finally had to make a decision. So now you apply your decision rule here. The decision rule is you have four data points below the aim line. You apply your decision rule. Should you wait, raise the goal, or make a change? Well, the decision, obviously looking at those data, is to make a change. How do you know what to do? Well, let's take a look at, at Tim's work samples. So here's his reading sample, and you'll notice that he read 129 words correct out of 131 in one minute, with only two errors. So his fluency was pretty good, and his accuracy was pretty good. Um, this is true in the second pro, where he read, uh, read 101 out of 102 words correct. So fluency was good, accuracy was good. This is a qualitative features checklist that the teacher completed. This has to do with the qualitative features. You can see that the teacher indicated that he read fluently, he reads accurately, he has a strategy for unknown words, he reads, um, he, he, his errors that he makes still preserve the meaning, he read with expression, he had good prosody, and he self-corrected. But what she did say here, if you can read it, he's not too motivated. His behavior impedes his learning. Um, he's having trouble adapting to the new school that he's in here. And those were the, those were the teacher's notes here, so I wanted to highlight those. So he, she says that he reads fluently and accurately. There's no error patterns. He reads with expression. Um, and he seems to have some trouble with multisyllabic words. That's the only place where she found any kind of difficulty. You could conduct additional assessment if needed. The teacher didn't think there was additional assessment needed here. So she decided to put a motivational system in place. She felt like the problem here wasn't necessarily his academic performance, but his behavior. So she thought he has the skills, but may not be motivated to learn. So what did she do? She identifies a daily goal for Tim. He effectively he wins a homework pass. If his goal is met, he gets points towards a homework pass. If he gets two points, he gets a homework pass. So that was the plan put in place for Tim. And here's what happened. So we look at his data four points into the change. Now, what you'll notice here is Tim's performance, his level, has not changed from where it was at the end of the time when we put the instructional change in place. He hasn't shown an increasing trend, but he did show something very important. His behavior stabilized. There was less variability, and there was stability in the behavior. So what the motivational, uh, perform, uh, motivational system did was stabilize his performance. So again, the decision rules were applied. And after four data points below the aim line, the question was, should I wait? Should I raise the goal? Or should I make a change? Well, the teacher said, let's make a change. So the teacher, th so the question would be, what instructional strategy would you use next? What instructional strategy? And in this case, the focus was, was going to be on improving fluency, continue the, mo the, the motivational system, and to practice decoding multisyllabic words. That appears to be that reading skills are not a big problem, and the one area that might be helpful for him would be to use multi to get some work on multisyllabic words. And then they, so she created some repeating reading practice with a peer, a mini lesson taught before reading practice, having the student reteach it to a peer who has poor performance in reading. I'm a great believer in one of the ways you can really help kids learn is have them teach it to someone else. If you can teach something to somebody else, you're probably going to have great success in learning it yourself. You might can try that with, with kids sometimes. You'd be amazed at the outcomes. So here was the result 
of the instructional change, keeping the motivation system in place, repeated practice, and multisyllabic practice. And you can see the trend after those four data points was in the, was in the right direction. And indeed, the result at that data point was to continue, and certainly this teacher then continued four more data points, and indeed he met the aim line. It was back to a performance that had been where he started. So this is just a good example of how one works through this process over time. Um, remember, the ultimate goal is not to get better performance on a test, of course, but to get to improve performance through better teaching. Um, and it's always important to remember that our goal is not just to get better outcomes on the, on the progress monitoring measure we're using, but it's really to get kids to show improved performance through better teaching. When you think about making instructional changes, what are some of the things we can do? Well, you could teach more of something and less of something else in the same amount of time. Or we could essentially just a lot more time. We could increase the amount of time for instruction. We could group kids differently. We could use different materials. We could use different strategies within the reading materials. We can add personnel to allow for more guided practice. These are just some of the things we can do for instructional change. And when I think about instructional change, I like to think about it in terms of the level of those changes. And I think about them in three different ways. That instructional change can be simple, can be moderate, or can be intensive. Some of the simple interventional ch interventions that we can use when we talk about intervention change are those kinds of interventions when there really is no major change to the instructional process. And that is, for example, we increase motivation. So for example, with Tim, we made a simple change in that we increased his motivation to, the, to, to perform. We might have students graph their own data. That might be a very simple intervention, again, motivational. We might provide a simple reminder or a cue card for something instructionally for a student. We might provide an effort at students doing self-monitoring. Or we might alter the timing of the assessment or the instruction as a way to do it. These are very simple interventions that don't require any change to the instructional process at all. These are always easy to implement. They may have significant impact. Many times we can change student performance by recognizing we have a performance problem, a motivational problem. And it makes sense to try these first rather than alter the instructional process right away. Now, moderate levels of intervention, this is when what we try to do is we make changes that enhance the existing instruction. Many times, there are many, many strategies we can, be, we can use here. And we're not necessarily going to change the instructional process, but we're going to enhance it. So we're going to take elements of what instruction we're, on, we're already doing and we may intensify them, or we may focus on an aspect of that instructional process. Um, we may find a specific skill within that instructional process that we need to emphasize. So we're going to emphasize inferential comprehension type thinking, or we're going to em emphasize finding the main idea in a passage. So we're going to, we may just enhance the instructional process by focusing in on elements of the instruction that are already going on without major changes in the instructional process. Um, these often require small amounts of additional resources. So moderate to interventions, you still often need some additional resources or time. And we try to fit these into the instructional, existing instructional processes. We want to maximize the opportunity to include others to maximize instructional time. So again, what we're trying to do here is we're maximizing instructional time within the time that we have. We're altering the instructional process with the materials we're using, and we try to get it to fit within what we're currently doing. Now, when we get to intensive interventions, this is when we're really going to have to do something that's fairly substantial. 
This can be involving changing curriculum or changing uh, program materials within the curriculum. We might want to be changing instructional groupings. We might add intensive one-on-one -on -one instruction for a, a period of time. These are very intensive levels, and these do require more resources, and they require more time. Um, they're going to require additional support to put into place, so you have to figure out how to make that happen. And they may require additional consultation or professional development to be able to pull, put these strategies in place. So using intensive interventions is, a, is something that we all do, but they have to be done with measured thinking because they're going to require resources and time to put them into place. Um, there are two forms that, we, that I want to reiterate here um, that are forms that we can use for documenting the database decision-making process, and these are excellent forms. Um, and I'm not going to necessarily put them up here now, but I know they're available um, as downloads. Uh, the SERF form is a great form for, for, progress monitor, for monitoring the progress of, your, of students through the database decision-making process. It can take you from one point to the other. And there's another form, the database decision-making form is another form that can certainly be available to you um, as a way to do the database decision-making process. So what I'd like to do now is uh, hopefully we're going to be able to uh, get this video to work and for folks to be able to hear the video, hear the audio. This is an excellent uh, video of a database decision-making process. Now the team here you're going to see is using the STAR assessment process, but it really illustrates how this process looks in action. It's called RTI, Database Decision Making in Action, and uh, hopefully you will all be able to hear the video and see the video as it's being played. There may be some delays in places. Um, as the video is being played, please let us know through the chat box if you're having great difficulty with the audio or the video, and then Molly can make some adjustments. So this video runs about five minutes or, or, or so, but it's, a, it's well worth us watching this together as we watch how database decision making works in action. Go ahead, Molly, ro Molly roll the video. I'm Suzanne Lawson, Prince Floyd Brown International Academy. We're an international baccalaureate primary years program, a public school located in Denver, Colorado, approximately five minutes from downtown Denver. I'd like to invite you into our school today to learn a bit about our RTI response to intervention model that we've created and implemented in our tool. This is just one example of how data-driven decision-making can contribute to student success. RTI is the practice of providing high-quality research-based instruction and interventions matched to student needs, monitoring their progress on a regular basis, and using student data to make instructional decisions. The goal really is accelerating learning for all students. Data team meetings are the heart of the RTI process, and in our school we conduct those meetings weekly with grade level teachers and intervention teachers during their 45 minute specials or planning time. Uh, my previous target goal from uh, the end of January was to target a group of eight students who were not doing so well on the STAR early literacy test, and I wanted to raise their overall scale score to at least a 740. And I've been just trying to close the gap between students in my class, and so I took my lowest eight students on the STAR test, and then I pinpointed some areas where I thought we could work on to help improve their scale score. And so um, we worked on completing sequences, word boundaries, and ABC order. We had pretty good success. At the beginning of my SMART goal, no one was at a scale score of 740, and um, at the end of the six weeks, five out of the eight had made 740 as a goal or higher. Um, I, had, I mean, I had someone during the six weeks who grew 220 scale score points just by focusing in on those three areas that were his weaknesses. Um, a lot of really great I think this is the one opportunity we have every week to hear from teachers how they're teaching and how students are learning and support them in adjusting their instruction um, to meet the needs of all kids. 
it is the way that we can ensure that all students in our building are learning and that we're supporting teachers in providing quality instruction in the classroom. So you might think about, it looks like your graphic organizers to me, I mean, they're wonderful, but look at several different comprehension strategies. So you have retail, story elements, main idea and supporting details, sequencing. You built them all in, which is really cool. But you might want to think about what, what's the one you really want to push hard once you select that specific focus, pre and post test with the same kind of assessment. Because this is definitely multiple comprehension strategies. Not that they wouldn't practice, continue to practice all those, but for the purpose of your targeted area, it just would simplify it, I think, to have a single focus. Because if we make our goals too broad, then your brain kind of, it's right. easier for you if you have one really clear goal and you talk about it with your and you will see in the context of data team meetings, teachers move very quickly from their current analysis of that body of evidence to what am I going to do as a teacher to support them in closing the achievement gap, to fill in areas which are identified as um, weaknesses or deficiencies in their background. It's a very uh, positive, hopeful, proactive way to plan for instruction. You're looking at kids testing at 85% or higher on AR. Yeah. But that's, that's one of your goals. Yeah. Another goal is that they take at least two AR tests a week so that they're reading often. And then your other one would be around a particular comprehension strategy. What's your gut feeling? What do you feel like you might target in in terms of comprehension strategy? Do you feel like main idea in detail or do you feel like summarizing? I feel like summarizing. What do you think? Right. What do you think of summarizing? I feel like summarizing has helped my students the most because then they're able to retell the story, apply the comprehension strategies that we use at the table, and then it shows on our AR report. You kind of have to teach main idea and supporting details to get to that written yeah, summary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but that's, that's going to be kind of your end result, you think, that they can write a summary. Yeah. That's, okay. As I think about it, it, you know, the feedback we receive as educators historically on the work we're doing, our success in, in supporting student learning, we would receive once a year. That's a yeah, and, and that's in the summer after the school year is over and the test results come in and you won't even have the same students next year. In other words, there was no feedback system, no way to self-correct in course. Um, and, I mean, really, could, could an airplane arrive at its destination that didn't have a set of instruments that gave a constant feedback that guided, uh, guided the plane towards its ultimate goal? This is you know, what, what RTI and what formative and diagnostic assessments enable us to do is receive constant feedback on the, on the success of our, our, our curriculum and our instructional practices. One of the things that I actually really like about the student progress monitoring is it, it not only visually shows, like, how they're testing, but also the next it shows the kids stuff. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, I print it off every single week, and they, they take it home with them. I want them to show so parents. I want them to explain it to their their parents or guardians. I want them to show their classroom teacher. So they they can see their scale score. Okay, last week I scored 254, but this week I scored 346. Tell me the changes in that. You know, what, is, what does that look like? Look at the scale score. So they understand that not only visually can they see it, but they can actually like read it, talk about and them, talk what about they've it. done to improve. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love the idea of doing it at home. When yeah. I show my students each from the party in the teacher lab for their parts monitoring, um, and so I just show them on the screen. But I think I'm going to start printing it off because I feel like if they explain it maybe to their parents, they can yeah. take more ownership, like you said. Totally. And really have to understand it in order to be able to explain it. Exactly. The data team context has really given us an opportunity to engage in um, reflection, 
inquiry, collaborative problem solving, uh, generation of new ideas, et cetera, on a regular, systematic basis. So you really see in the context of data teams much more thoughtful conversations about what is instructional best practice here, what's working and not working for different students, for different circumstances, and what kind of adaptation to instruction or intervention are yielding successful results for which students. There is no exact way to deliver instruction or perfect curriculum. It really is dynamic and has to be aligned with Thanks, Molly. Sorry, I'm trying to get this off the screen. <laughs> yeah, I want to get that back up. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, and uh, I, I know the video probably was a little bit shaky for some of you and uh, didn't sync really well, and the volume may have been problematic. But it's a really, really good uh, example of how to, sh to show teachers in a very short amount of time, the clip's about five minutes long, six minutes long, of the, of the data decision in action process. So uh, Molly, will, Molly, you will send everybody the link. You can bother to send it to everybody. You can do that. Um, okay, great, there, there's the link. It's a YouTube video, um, and if you just Google uh, um, uh, data in Action, RTI on YouTube, you should find the video and feel free to use it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an excellent d district. Um, so we're, we're coming to um, the, the Q&A period now and um, I'm more than happy to answer any, other, any questions that pop up here. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to Again, do the uh, obligatory wait until I can see if anybody has questions here, and then we will be more than happy to, to, to do this. Ah, the link is also posted on the web page. Very good, Molly. Thank you. Okay, I'm waiting. I see uh, someone is typing. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Well, uh, again, um, if there, if I don't see any questions popping up right now, and uh, I haven't seen any questions pop up during the webinar, um, I really want to uh, encourage anyone who has additional questions to feel free to uh, email me personally. I'd be more than happy to respond. Um, I, I think that the, um, I hope the webinar series has been helpful and has been useful in some ways that I added to folks' knowledge. Um, I also hope that you guys are using this, this great stuff that we've been trying to develop over the years um, for schools. I know here in my own state in Pennsylvania, uh, I work with quite a few schools that have been using these models of RTI at the elementary level for a number of years. And right now, um, uh, we're moving into the middle school with the RTI process quite a bit. Um, Again, uh, I want to remind everybody of, the, uh, of my uh, mantra that without data, it's only an opinion. And I think everybody knows how important this, this has been. Um, again, many, many thanks. I hope you found these webinars very useful. Um, again, uh, I will turn this back over to Molly. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the school year. And like I said, more than happy to answer questions that pop up offline. Molly, I'll turn this back over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shapiro, for today and for the entire webinar strand. We really appreciate uh, all the information you have shared with us. 
And anyone still on, if you could please take a few minutes. I posted the link to the survey. We do appreciate your feedback, and that does help us uh, as we plan going forward. So please take a few minutes for that, and hope everybody has a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Audio recording for this meeting has ended. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. Have All a good right. one.